Ukraine has dealt another devastating blow to Russia's navy, this time with a storm shadow cruise missile strike against the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters in Sebastopol. My name is Jerome Starkey. I'm the defence editor at The Sun newspaper, and this is your weekly roundup of the most important news from Ukraine. We'll start with the cruise missile strikes, the Storm Shadow cruise missile strikes against a submarine and a Rapucha class landing ship in Sebastopol, the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in occupied Crimea. Now, this was a spectacular success for Ukraine because they've managed to hit two principal vessels whilst they were both in dry dock in port. They hit a Kilo class submarine the rostov on don this is one of the this is one of the submarines that can launch caliber cruise missiles indeed has launched caliber cruise missiles which can hit targets right across ukraine it's the first time a russian submarine has been hit in an act of war since the end of world war ii lying next to it in the adjacent dry dock was the rapucha class landing ship the minsk these landing ships are designed with bows that open up so they can spew out tanks and uh, uh, armored vehicles onto a beach in a sort of d-day d-day style assault it's the fifth landing ship that ukraine has hit in the course of the last uh, year and a half since putin invaded the strikes bring to 10 the total number of confirmed strikes against russian Navy vessels and indeed the first time a submarine has been hit. Now it's significant because it's so spectacular, it's so visually obvious that Ukraine has scored a success and that's been made plain not only from the footage, the sort of phone clips that we've seen at the time of the explosions in the dark, but also from the satellite images taken before and after the strikes showing the damage to the ships. Now we know uh, one of the logs of equipment losses, uh, one of the independent logs of equipment losses has recorded the Rapucha class landing ship as destroyed and the submarine as damaged. Russia insists it will uh, repair them, but of course we await to see how and how quickly it's going to be made much harder by the fact that the dry docks have also been damaged and of course by the fact that Russia now knows that these docks, indeed this naval headquarters, is no longer safe. It is not immune from Ukrainian strikes. How Ukraine managed to get those missiles into the targets at that base remains something of a mystery. The base was protected, we understand, by a number of Russia's most sophisticated air defense systems including the S-300s and the more advanced S-400 systems, the most advanced uh, air defense systems Russia has. Now, when asked about this, we know that uh, the head of the British Royal Navy, the first Sea Lord, Admiral Ben Key, praised what he called Ukraine's innovations and their appetite for taking risk. He didn't go into any details, but we understand there were missions in the run-up preceding the storm shadow strikes to degrade the air defences to degrade the defences around the port. Uh, What we would have then seen is uh, Ukrainian aircraft taking off. uh, Those storm shadow missiles are launched from underneath jets. Russia says Ukraine launched 10, seven of which were shot down, but at least three got through. Now, those numbers we can't confirm, but that's what Russia has said. Of course, all this comes against the backdrop of North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un traveling to eastern Russia to meet Vladimir Putin. Now, this was a rare trip outside North Korea for Kim and indeed a rare meeting for President Putin with a foreign leader dubbed the Outcast Club. Both of these men, uh, global outcasts on the international stage. Vladimir Putin wants North Korean ammunition. North Korea has huge stockpiles of ammunition and Putin desperately needs it because he's been blasting his way through Russia's own stockpiles over the course of the last year and a half fighting in Ukraine. It was interesting to see what Kim wanted in exchange. Now the meeting took place, the first meeting took place at a remote Russian space base, Russia's most advanced space base, where they send rockets into space. Kim wants Russia's satellite technology. That's what we understand from General Sir Jim Hockenhull, uh, the commander of UK Strategic Command. He said there had been a number of failed satellite launches uh, by North Korea. And so Kim wants the rocket technology. 
he appears to be willing to give Russia weapons and ammunition in exchange. Indeed, after they met, they had a lavish banquet. Kim professed his unconditional support for what he called Russia's sacred fight against the West playing out in Ukraine. Should Ukraine be worried about this? Yes. Any boost to Russia's stockpiles will mean that its forces can continue to hammer them in, with artillery bombardments uh, across the front lines in Ukraine. And indeed, that's been a constant complaint of Ukrainian forces. It's just simply the volumes of ammunition, particularly heavy artillery ammunition, that Russia can fire at them. Both sides uh, are low on stockpiles. Both sides urgently need uh, ammunition from their allies. It's unlikely, however, to prove decisive. This ammunition will help Russia, but it's unlikely to swing the war so de decisively that Russia will win. It'll make it harder for Ukraine, but the fight will continue. I also want to talk about new revelations that have come out about an incident that took place at the end of last year when a Russian Su-27 fighter opened fire on a British Royal Air Force rivet joint plane over the Black Sea. Now, this was uh, revealed to Britain and to Parliament by the then Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. But at the time, he described it only as a potentially dangerous engagement. He said a missile was released in the vicinity of an RAF jet. The intention clearly at the time by both Ben Wallace and the Ministry of Defence was to downplay what had happened to avoid it escalating. But revelations in the BBC this week suggest that actually the Russian pilot deliberately fired. It was not a malfunction, as we were told at the time last year. Uh, the pilot believed he had permission to fire because he had misunderstood a command from a radar operator who said something along the lines of, you have the target. Now, we understand he fired one air-to-air -air missile, but it failed to lock onto the rivet joint as its target, and it missed. There was then an exchange between the pilots of the two Su-27s, this is according to the report in the BBC, with the pilot who hadn't fired, remonstrating, swearing at his wingman, uh, saying, you know, what were you doing? He insisted he did have permission. A second missile was then released from the same plane, but apparently it dropped away as if perhaps the launch had been aborted. Now, Curiously, we also understand that the crew of the rivet joint were not aware that they'd been fired upon until they got back to base and they had landed. And yet a lot of the, these new details that have emerged are based on intercepted conversations between the Russian pilots and between the pilots and the ground station. Now, we know the rivet joint's role is to, it's a spy plane, it's to soak up communications and Russian signals and intelligence. And it normally flies with a crew of about 30 specialist civilian spies from GCHQ, the government's listening post, in the back. And they would include linguists uh, to, to understand uh, some of the information that they might have been absorbing. But it's not clear, and it was certainly clear that they didn't have that information in real time. But nonetheless, had that Russian missile hit an RAF jet, had a British warplane been shot down in international airspace over the Black Sea, that would have been a huge international incident and it would have clearly pushed the world towards World War III. Now, we would have to hope that even in that situation, uh, the, the rival sides would be able to step away from the brink, but it would certainly uh, could have been used uh, as a trigger for Article 5 and, and NATO's collective defence mechanism. Finally, a quick update on where the, uh, the counteroffensive, Ukraine's counteroffensive, indeed Russia's continuing assaults are. The focus for Ukraine continues to be in south central Zaporizhia province. They have uh, broken through some of uh, Russia's first offensive, but, but progress is slow and costly. Uh, no major advances to report in the last week. Russia continues to mass its troops and focus its attack on the northeastern town of Kupiansk. We understand, understand some 50,000 Russian soldiers are involved uh, in that assault. The Ukrainians insist that they keep on attacking, but they are not getting through. Interestingly, a report in the Wall Street Journal suggests that the Russians are using units known as Storm Z troops. These are units drawn from Russian penal colonies, the prisoners who were offered their freedom in exchange for their fighting. Um, Ukrainian sources claiming to the journal that in fact in some cases just one in three of those soldiers is given a rifle and they're expected to pick up the rifle from uh, their fallen comrade as and when he gets killed or wounded. So pretty desperate accounts of that 
battle. That's all from me for today. Hope to do this again next week when I'll be back in Ukraine. Um, of course, if you do have any questions, please make them in the comments and we will do our best, uh, we'll do our best to answer them next time. Thank you.